rest of that night, the Hispaniola sailed on towards the treasure island. But the breeze was light and we made slow progress across the moonlit sea. Dark shadows thrown from masts and sails lay across the deck. The air was warm, and the only sounds, the creaking of the rigging and the gentle lap of water from our bows. Such was the beauty of that night, and yet we were in danger of our very lives. Unable to sleep, I sat on deck wondering at our predicament, turning over in my mind the events of the last few hours. We knew that Silver, in his cunning, planned to strike only when the treasure was aboard and the ship back in the trades. Then he would kill us, every one. But what could we possibly do? They outnumbered us by 19 men to seven. I hoped and prayed to God that there might be other true men on board who'd fight with us when the time arrived. At least we had time on our side, and for the moment, control of the powder and arms. But for how long? It was with these problems on my mind that I finally fell asleep upon the deck. For how long I slept, I do not know. It must have been for several hours at least. For when I awoke, it was morning, and the first rays of sunshine were warm upon my brow and warned of the long, hot day that lay ahead. For a moment, my thoughts turned once more to our predicament. And then I remembered the island. It had been hardly visible at night, but now it should be close by. The sight of it all but took my breath away. Here at last, emerging from the early morning mist, was Treasure Island. It was sinister and yet beautiful. Grey coloured woods covered a large part of the surface, topped by hills that caught the early rays of sun. In the lower lands were streaks of yellow sand break, with beach all round, and gleaming surf that foamed and thundered, and through which there seemed no place to land. Towering above the island stood the spyglass. Rising from tall pines, the sides ran sheer on almost every side, with the top suddenly cut off. It stood like some menacing sentinel, keeping guard over the island and its treasure. We had a dreary morning's work that day, for there was not a breath of wind, and the ship was warped three or four miles round the corner of the island, and up the narrow passage to Haven behind Skeleton Island. The captain had told the squire, the doctor, and myself that we should act quite normally, and give no sign that we knew of Silver's plans. So I volunteered for one of the boats, taking my place alongside the crew. All the way in, Long John stood by the steersman, giving directions, as though he knew the passage like the back of his hand. He never hesitated once. But though we had no trouble getting in, the crew grumbled fiercely over their work in the sweltering heat, and I thought this a very bad sign. Would Silver be able to control them, or would they soon turn on us? The sight of the island had relaxed the cords of their discipline. We dropped anchor about a third of a mile from either shore, the mainland on one side and Skeleton Island on the other. Around us, in the almost landlocked bay, the trees came right down to high water mark, burying the shore. And on the mainland, two small rivers, almost swamps, emptied into the sea. The foliage in that area had a kind of poisonous brightness. There was not a breath of air moving, nor a sound but that of the surf booming on the beaches more than a mile away. And in the air there hung a stagnant smell, a smell of sodden leaves and rotted trees. The doctor sniffed the air and then observed, Well, I don't know about any treasure, but I'll stake me wig there's fever here. If the conduct of the men had been worrying in the boat, it became truly threatening now that they were back on board. They lay about the deck growling together in talk, and even the slightest order was grudgingly obeyed. 
Mutiny, it was plain, hung over us like a thundercloud. But there was one man who fairly outstripped himself in willingness and civility. Long John Silver was smiles to everyone, giving advice here and a merry word there, and obeying every order with a cheerful, Aye, aye, sir, to which his parrot, Captain Flint, would usually reply, Please, please, all right. Please, please, all right. Please, please, all right. And while Silver tried so hard to cheer the crew, the captain held a council in his cabin. As well as Squire Trelawney, the doctor and myself, the captain insisted that Hunter, Joyce and Redruth, the squire's three men, be present, that they might be told of our position. They received the news with less surprise and a better spirit than we'd looked for, a reaction that cheered us all. Squire Trelawney, gentlemen, the crew are on the verge of mutiny. You've all seen that. If I give any order now, they'll turn on us. If I give no order, Silver will suspect we know something. But Silver's as keen as we are that there be no fighting yet. He wants the treasure aboard and the ship at sea again before he strikes. So we'll play it his way. And what is it that you have in mind, Captain Smollett? It's this, sir. I'll tell the crew they can have the afternoon ashore. Now, Silver will be all for this. It'll give them a chance to talk them out of any hasty action. If they all go ashore, we have the ship. If they stay, then we fight it out. At least we have all the arms and powder. Splendid idea, Smollett, splendid. You're a man after my own heart, a man of action. Let's get to it straight away. Thus, Captain Smollett went on deck and told the grumbling crew the afternoon was theirs to go ashore and spy the land. I do believe the silly fellows must have thought they'd break their shins on treasure as soon as they landed. For now, they were all smiles and laughter. It was plain, too, that Silver was delighted with the plan. For when the captain went below to await events, our cook soon organised the boats to take the men ashore. But he did not entirely fall into our trap. He made sure that six men stayed behind, so that the captain's idea of seizing the ship was now thwarted. And then it was there came into my head the first of the mad notions that contributed so much to save our lives. If six men were left by silver, it was plain that our party could not take and fight the ship. And since only six were left, it was equally plain that the cabin party had no need of my assistance. It occurred to me at once to go ashore. In a jiffy, I'd slipped over the side and curled up in the foresheets of the nearest boat and almost at the same moment, she shoved off. No one took any notice of me, only the bower saying, Is that you, Jim? Keep your head down, boy. But Silver looked sharply from the other boat and called out to know if that were me. And from that moment, I began to regret what I had done. The crews raced for the beach. But the boat I was in, having some start, and being at once the lighter and the better manned, shot far ahead of her consort. The minute our bow had struck among the shoreside trees, I was out and running through the woods, while Silver and the rest were still a hundred yards behind. Jim! Jim, lad, wait a minute! Wait for old John! But you may suppose I paid no heed to his calling. Jumping, ducking and breaking through, I ran and ran straight before my nose. I wanted as much distance as possible between myself and Long John Silver. I was so pleased at having given Long John the slip that once I'd put the landing party a safe distance behind me, I began to enjoy myself and look around me with some interest on the strange land that I was in. I'd crossed a marshy tract full of willows, bulrushes and odd outlandish swampy trees and climbed up to an open piece of undulating sandy country about a mile long. It was dotted with a few pines and a great number of contorted trees, not unlike the oak in growth, but pale in foliage like willows. I now felt for the first time the joy of exploration. The isle was uninhabited. My shipmates I had left behind, and nothing lived in front of me but dumb brutes and fowls. 
I turned hither and thither among the trees, noticing plants, insects and birds, all unknown to me. But all at once there began to go a sort of bustle among the bulrushes. A wild duck flew up, followed by another. Then, as I looked back, I saw a great cloud of birds screaming and circling in the air above the swamp, which steamed in the strong sun. I judged at once that my shipmates must be drawing near. And nor was I deceived, for soon I heard the distant and low tones of a human voice, which grew steadily louder and nearer. This put me in great fear, and I crawled under the cover of the nearest oak-like tree and squatted there, hearkening, as silent as a mouse. Slowly the voice grew louder. Then another joined in, and though I could not hear the words clearly, I was sure one of the voices was silver. At last, the speaker seemed to have paused, and perhaps to have sat down, for not only did the sound cease to draw nearer, but the birds began to grow more quiet and to settle again to their places in the swamp. Inch by inch I crawled forward, thinking that since I'd been so foolhardy as to come ashore with these desperados, the least I could do was overhear them at their councils. When I came close, looking through the leaves, I could see down into the little green dell beside the marsh and closely set about with trees. And there, Long John Silver and another of the crew stood face to face in conversation. Matey, it's because I think gold dust of you. Gold dust, and you may lay to that. If I hadn't a took to you like pitch, do you think I'd have been here a warning of you? It's to save your neck, I tell you, from the wild ones who are set on murder and the treasure. Silver, you're old and you're honest and you're brave or I'm mistook. So will you tell me you'll be led by that mess of swabs? <laughs> Not you. Like me, you'd rather lose your hand than side with those murderers. If that's the case, I'm with you. This was clearly one of the honest hands. Well, here at the same moment came news of another. Far away, out in the marsh, there arose all of a sudden the most dreadful sound. The rocks of the spyglass re-echoed it a score of times. The whole troop of marsh birds rose again, darkening heaven with a simultaneous whirr. And then it died away, as silence re-established its empire, and only the rustle of the redescending birds and the boom of the distant surges disturbed the languor of the afternoon. In heaven's name, what was that noise, John Silver? <laughs> That, oh that, well matey, I reckon that'll be Alan. I suppose he couldn't see sense like you're going to, aren't you, Tom? Poor Tom. He said nothing for a moment as the full impact of Silver's words slowly dawned on him. You mean, you? You had Alan killed for being a true seaman? John Silver, long you've been a mate of mine. But you're a mate of mine no longer. You've killed Alan, have you? Well, kill me too if you can, for I'll not join you and your murderers. And then, as I looked on, almost paralysed with fear, young Tom turned away from Silver and walked defiantly towards the edge of the clearing. But he was not destined to go far. Silver seized a tree branch, whipped the crutch from his armpit and hurled it at poor Tom. <coughs> He fell like a stone, and Silver, even with one leg as agile as a monkey, was on him in an instant, knife in hand. For a moment, the whole world swam away from me in a whirling mist. Silver and the birds, and the tall spyglass hilltop, going round and round and topsy-turvy before my eyes, and all manner of bells ringing and voices shouting in my ear. I came to with the sweat pouring down my face and a trembling in my limbs that I could scarce control. Until this moment, though realising the danger of my position, I'd still felt a certain excitement about the treasure and the pirates. But now I'd seen a man, a good man, killed before my very eyes by that monster silver. I was absolutely terrified. 
Before me in the clearing lay poor Tom, his eyes staring, his clothes a mass of blood. Of his killer, there was no sign. But he'd be back, no doubt, to look for me and plenty others with him. So then I picked myself up off the ground and ran. I ran as never before, scarce minding the direction of my flight as long as it led me from the murderers. Through thickets where great thorns tore at my clothes and body. Under tall trees where hanging vines and creepers tangled in my way. Across boulder strewn clearings and streams. And as I ran, my fear grew and grew, turning into a kind of frenzy. At last. When there was no strength left in me to run, I collapsed upon the ground, worn out in spirit and in body. I saw no chance now of returning to the Hispaniola. Silver's men would be searching for me high and low, and Squire Trelawney and the others would no doubt disown me as a deserter. But at that moment, a fresh alarm put all these thoughts from my mind. From the steep side of the hill above me, a spout of gravel was dislodged and fell rattling and bounding through the trees. Then more stones fell, and I saw the strangest figure. Either bear or man or monkey, I could in no wise tell. I had no energy left in me to run once more, and anyway I doubt if I could have matched the speed and agility of the strange creature that flitted towards me through the trees. Grabbing a hefty branch, I backed up to an old oak and waited. Then, as the creature drew nearer, running from cover to cover and peering at me through the branches, I perceived it was a man, yet unlike any man that I had ever seen before. All of a sudden he was before me. He threw himself upon his knees, his hands held out in supplication. He was the very strangest sight. Of all the beggarmen that I had ever seen, he was the chief for raggedness. He was dressed with tatters of old ship's canvas and sea cloth, all held together by a system of the most various and incongruous fastenings, brass buttons, stick and twine. And about his waist, he wore an old brass buckled leather belt. I could see now that he was a white man like myself, and that his features were even pleasing. His skin, wherever exposed, was burnt by the sun. Even his lips were black, and his fair eyes looked quite startling in so dark a face. A face on which so many different quizzical expressions came and went as he tried to size me up. I must admit, I took an instant liking to this crazy old fellow, though for the life of me, I couldn't imagine who he was or how he came to be on the island. In heaven's name, old man, who are you? <laughs> who, who am I? Who, who am I? Uh, oh, if only you knew what it meant to hear your voice, young man. Uh, I haven't heard another voice these last three years. Not met with Christian man or Christian diet, not seen another face or form, only goats and birds and trees and sea, and the thought that ever and for always it had be so. And now you come. <laughs> Have you got a piece of cheese, young man? Many's the long night I've dreamed of cheese. I've dreamed and dreamed, then woken up to find I've none. No cheese, old man, no cheese. But never mind. Tell me, what is your name? My name. My name? My name? Uh, uh, B ben. B ben Gunn. Ben Gunn, of course. Benjamin Gunn that ever was. Poor Ben Gunn. Alone. Alone for three years in this wretched place. <laughs> Poor Ben Gunn, indeed. The old man was so overcome at meeting another human being that he broke down and wept. So putting my arm around him, I helped him into the shade of the old oak, sat him down, and then allowed him in his own time to tell his story. And a dreadful story it was. Many years before, he'd sailed under that most feared buccaneer of all time, Captain Flint, a cold-blooded murderer who'd stopped at nothing in his quest for plunder and riches. And in that same crew had served Blind Pew, Black Dog, Billy Bones, and last of all, John Silver. Flint! 
Fred buried all his treasure here, and then he killed the six men who helped him bury it. So no one knows the place, and no one dared to ask. Then, years later, Ben Gunn had sailed by the island in another ship and persuaded the captain to put the crew ashore to hunt for the treasure. After twelve days of searching and digging, they'd found nothing. So in anger and frustration, they'd left Ben Gunn on the island with no more than a spade and a pickaxe. They sailed away and left me, boy, left me all alone and told me if I found the treasure, I could keep it. And so, just as Ben Gunn had told me his story, so I told him mine, from my days at the Admiral Benbow right up to the present time. When I'd finished, he was silent for a moment. Then he looked up. So it seems I'm not the only one in trouble. I I'm not the only one who needs help. I'll tell you what, Jim. You help me and I'll help you. Just what do you mean, I asked, wondering if he were up to some trick. Only this, boy, only this. <laughs> ben Gunn knows the island like the back of his hand. I know all the paths and all the hidden ways. You put in a good word for me with your captain. Get me a place in his crew and a passage home and a cheese to eat. And I'll help you back to the ship. I've, I've got my own boat tucked away. Made it with my own hands, I did. It's hidden under the white rock. I had no time to take in this good news, for at that moment all the echoes of the island awoke to the heavy thunder of cannon fire. They've begun to fight. Now, Ben, Ben, I give my word I'll help you, but help me now. Guide me to your boat. I must get to the Hispaniola before it's too late. No word from Ben. He simply grabbed my hand and ran. Down through the tall trees we went, where despite his obvious age, I could scarce keep up with him. He hopped and skipped and jumped down the slope as agile as a monkey. From the tall trees we moved into and through dense undergrowth, on narrow paths that turned and twisted through the forest. And then suddenly we halted in our tracks. Could we believe our eyes? Before us, through an opening in the thicket, we saw the outline of a building. And above it, fluttering in the breeze, the Union Jack. <laughs> <laughs>